Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. All right, we're live. Derek Melkor, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Bo. How are we doing? How are we doing, buddy? Good, man. Good. It's uh, good to get to meet you virtually here. We talked a little bit online back and forth and have some mutual friends, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to get to talk to you today. Yeah, I've been a big fan of your show for a long time and uh, listen to the podcast, man. Anytime I got to go out, do anything outside, mow the lawn, I'm always listening on the podcast and what, what you guys got going on. So I appreciate the invite. I'm excited. Yeah, that's awesome. And and you're so you also have some podcasting experience too because you <laughs> co host with uh the OKS Hunter and, and our, our mutual friend Eric over there. Eric was actually the one Eric Clark introduced us. He actually reached out to me the other day. Uh, we were talking about something on social media and he was like, Hey, uh, you should really look into having uh my buddy Derek on. He hunts some some big woods tracks in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. And I think he'd be a really good fit. And, and then you and I started talking and a few days later, here we are. Yeah, it didn't, <laughs> didn't take too long and we made it happen. Yeah, uh, Eric's a great guy and Greg over there at OKS Hunter. I've been really happy to be able to hang out and share like our season with them and do the OKS Hunter podcast. So that's been really fun and appreciative of Eric because he's always looking to, you know, he always wants to better everybody else. So that totally makes sense that he'd be like, oh, you should talk to this person. Like Eric's just such a good yeah. guy like that. So. Our, uh, how we run our okay is hundred podcasts. It's a little bit different than how you do yours, but you got some uh, great information <laughs> on yours. Ours is mostly banter and silliness. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, it's fun. To, it's fun to listen to those styles too. Like I, I listen to such a variety of podcasts throughout and, and it all depends on the mood. Like there's times where I'm like really wanting to learn something specific. And then there's other times I just want to hear conversations of people that make me laugh or, or, you know, do whatever. And it's just like, it's, uh, I, I like the style because it's just, it's free flowing and you guys have a good time together. I think it's a, it's a pretty cool show. It's definitely got a little bit more entertainment than always informational value, but, yeah. but Eric does do a really good job getting some great guests who like really know their stuff. So it's like, it, you know, he tries to be a good mix for it. Yeah, I, I, I can definitely see that. And I remember being a guest on there. I don't know. I guess it's been over two years because we were talking and you weren't on there yet at that time. Yep. It was Greg and Eric and, and, uh, and yeah, I thought they directed it really well. And, and Eric's and the team there are very talented as far as with the, the video side of it and they've figured out live streaming and all these things that that i haven't even got to yet like they're they're definitely got uh they've got do some good things there. yeah eric is a wizard man and he's just a great guy great guy anyway we can support yeah, I, him that's what i always try to do because he does it for everybody else yep i love i love the the whole like meaning behind okay as hunter which i'd love for you to kind of uh before we go into your background, talk just while we're on this topic, talk a little bit about what OKS Hunter is. Yeah, so the idea of OKS Hunter was kind of Eric's, you know, brainchild after I think it was he had shot like a, a young doe during like, a, I don't know if it was gun season or bow season here in Wisconsin, and he shot a young doe. And he was excited because he hadn't gotten a deer in a number of years. And here he got a deer, had a great hunt, made a great memory, and I think he had posted a photo to social media probably Facebook or something. And like, he was excited to like, he earned this moment. He got his deer guy doesn't deer hunt that much, you know, doesn't have much time. He runs a busy schedule. And like the first four or five people who said something, it was all like super negative. Like, why would you shoot such a small deer? Like you're terrible, blah, blah, blah. He was like, is this what it's supposed to be like? And like, Eric is a bit of a philanthropist and like, he loves like diving into that. And so it just really irked him. And he was like, like, this is ridiculous. Like, why can't we support each other and just be happy? It's my tag, my hunt. And then he kind of like brought that mantra out, my tag, my hunt. Everyone's in a different place in their hunting journey. Um, And like that should be celebrated, not like ridiculed. So like some people who are just starting out, you know, their standards should be different than someone who's put in like a crazy amount of hours like you have. And, you know, I know I've, you know, made this my life is what I like to do. But like I've, my time doesn't mean everyone's had that so like support each other in the hunting community make hunting fun again it's not measured in inches deer tag it's your hunt shoot what makes you happy and like 
enjoy it. And that was a message that I was like, oh my God, I can totally get behind that. Like, it's good to, no matter where you are, you know, bringing the fun back into it and not being so serious about it all the time was like really refreshing to me. Cause I just like get yeah. caught up, you know, in myself and like, I just, you put pressure on yourself. You're like, it's not what it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about enjoying your time, hanging out with buddies, being happy for each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I totally understand that. And like, I get caught up in it all the time with myself of like, you know, wanting to better myself and like trying to, you know, chase the next big buck. And I love that. And I'm not, I don't plan on changing that, but like at the same time, it's like, you know, I've talked about it quite a bit recently on the podcast, but as far as like, everyone's in a different place and you can't have, you know, just having the, the mountain buck scouting camp here recently, I had people from all different variety, like of, experience levels and everything that come in you know some had not even killed a deer with their bow and others have been doing it their whole life and wanted like to, to chase the next level and then others were just trying to get their first you know first deer with a bow and it's like okay there's two that's two completely different you know experience levels and there's a million different experience levels yep. in between you know so there's like it's it's important to understand that and not have you know, I'm all for setting big goals, you know, whether it's in hunting or life, but you also have to be realistic if you want to enjoy it. And that's, the, you know, the point yep. of doing it is to enjoy it and uh, to be able to do that. And so I, I thought that was cool. And I love the apparel that goes along with the OK as Hunter, the shooter buck, which is like the little four oh, yeah. spike thing that's on. I, I, yeah, you got, yeah, yeah, you got it right on your hat there. <laughs> yeah, I think it. I think it's pretty awesome, and it, it's been cool to see. I've been seeing the apparel floating around trade shows and stuff more now, and I was like, "That's awesome that it's getting out." Because I remember when when Eric first started it there, however many years ago. I remember following along with it and seeing it grow. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, it was kind of funny that you mentioned the little four corn antler that Eric used for his logo. We uh, <clears throat> we did we did a couple of trade shows, and uh, we got to go to the Iowa Deer Classic, which I was super pumped to go to, just as like a big buck enthusiast, I was like, oh my God, like I want to go see these things. So we, Greg made this amazing booth and Eric and Tyler had everything organized and we set up this whole booth and Eric's like, you know, what do you think? Do you think we're going to, think we're going to stand out? Think we're going to make a splash? I looked around, I was like, Eric, everyone has like Canadian shed antler on their hat. We have a four corn. We're definitely going to stand out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> big antlers everywhere and we got the four corn. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's so awesome. <laughs> and uh, so let, I, I'd like to dive a little bit into the background of you. You know, you, you were telling me before we were talking before we were talking live here, you grew up in Wisconsin and just talk a little bit about your kind of your growing up and kind of the culture there in Wisconsin. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, lived there for most of my life. And my parents had a cabin that my dad built when I was just born. He built it. So every year of my life, that's what I've known. Is the cabin up north uh we got like 23 acres never really hunted on it for deer it, we hunt on the national forest all around it but that's where i grew up hunting bow hunting up there when i was 12 years old um dad used to take me my dad was a very very avid successful hunter for that area um wisconsin definitely has a really strong hunting heritage like the gun hunt the nine day gun hunt is you know a tradition similar to Pennsylvania. Everyone used to take off. It was deer camp. Everybody brought chili and bush light. And like you guys stayed at camp and like some guys hunted, some guys just came for the camaraderie and never made it to the woods, but like it was deer camp. Um, and my yeah. dad had that kind of group when he was younger uh, and when I was younger, but when I started, he kind of like gave his wild buddies the boot and he like wanted to like focus on me. So as cool as that was, I got to hang out with my dad and experience it. Like, got that deer camp like like that vibe that like he grew up with like I didn't have that but uh man we spend a lot of time in the woods and my dad being a really really great hunter to learn from I was just lucky I was just a byproduct and I know your dad spent a lot of time with your dad in the woods yep. so my learning curve just by what he passed down was so much greater than most and I was just you know lucky to have a guy who spent so much time in the woods and was able to like teach me and show me and uh, what my dad always did is when we go out scouting or walking, I'd always walk behind him. And then when we got to our destination, he'd say, all right, take me back to the truck. So it was like, 
at a young age, you paid attention to like what, you know, what tree you walk by because dad was going to say, okay, take me back to the truck. So uh, I got I had pretty good woodsmanship growing up just because I had to. <laughs> Otherwise, we were walking in. You had to. <laughs> but uh, no. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> when I was about 14, I think I asked my mom if she wanted to come hunting because I'm an only child. So when dad and I were in the woods all the time, mom was just sitting at home alone, twiddling her thumbs. Says, mom, you want to come hunt with me? So she picked up hunting and then uh, we've been hunting together ever since. So oh, that's, that's kind of awesome. my background. You, yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, a couple things. There's like, you know, everyone always compares Michigan and Pennsylvania a lot, but the more I've got to know people from Wisconsin, it sounds like it's the very, it's the same yeah. thing. It's that, that deer camp heritage, you know, going North and having, you know, we had the same exact thing with our deer camps, you know, growing up, you have the people that are your diehard hunters that go to camp. And then you have the guys that don't really <laughs> care to go out. They might, they might go for a walk in the afternoon or something, but they're there to, to drink beer and play cards and hang out. And that's, you know, that's fine too. It's all, it's all about that that experience and, and, you know, and two, just like, that's awesome that you got, you have, you know, your dad that you were able to learn from and be able to, to, to do that. Like I've said it a million times, but that's, I definitely contribute any of my success that I've had fr from him and learning and being right there, you know, and, and him, you know, not, I don't know if being hard on me is the right, the right term for it, but like, you know, he made me learn like, as far as like, you know, similar to like, you know, how you had to like find your way back. There was just little things that he would always do or, or learn to be quiet in the woods. Cause I was like, still am not the best as far as, you know, stumbling over things sometimes and tripping. And, and you know, I, I always remember I'd like trip and fall and I'd break <laughs> a branch. He'd, he'd give me that oh, look. I know not the look. like, are you okay? <laughs> like, what are you doing? I, <laughs> yeah, you give that look and I was like, uh Oh, I'm, I, I can't be doing that. I got to watch my step a little bit more. And, uh, but yeah, that's, it's, it's so great to that. Um, uh, you know, we had those backgrounds to be able to learn. And I think that's, what's cool about podcasts and videos and stuff now that, you know, people that didn't have that can learn from those experiences that we've been lucky enough to have and spend the time doing it. So you, it's, it's, it's nice that, that we can you do hit that the now. nail on the head. Cause I've always thought that just being an educator, a teacher myself, like I, you know, how people get information. I was just blessed that I had it firsthand from an early age. And so like, I always looked at people like that I met growing up, like, like Eric didn't really learn to hunt from his dad at an early age, a little bit, but like there was a time where he didn't really have him and Greg's dad kind of hunted, but not really. And like, I have so many friends who like just picked it up later in life, but the, that learning curve of like that information that you and I got at a young age, the dad taught us the hard way or whatever way we got it. And like, we just been able to grow. Like this is finally like the catch up. You know what I mean? For people who learned it on their own podcast, YouTube, like that's their way of like getting this information. It's still not firsthand, but it's way better than what yeah. was available, you know, 10 years ago for learning. You can only read so much in a magazine, right? Like. It's a great way to catch yeah, people up. And it was never, it was never relatable before to, you know, the people that were hunting, you know, big woods, national forest type yeah. areas like that stuff and, and nothing against the stuff that was in magazines, but it was focused around big bucks on managed properties for the most part. And it just wasn't, wasn't relatable. And I, I remember reading those magazines and my dad kind of shaking his head at me. Cause I'm like, we got to try <laughs> yeah. this dad. Like, look, what's going on. You know, I gotta, I gotta take the biggest set of rattling antlers and just smash them together. They're going to come running. They're going to come bucks are going to be running. They're going to come running. And, uh, I need to find these field edges and I, I need to sit on these edges and, uh, you know, going through that, that, you know, side of things. And, and, uh, it's just, it's just funny looking at it now and just all the resources out there. I mean, I'm continuing to learn from other people all the time, like through the podcast like this and, and everything. And it's just, it's fun. I love learning and to getting to learn. And I think like, I think doing this podcast has helped me learn more, not even just from the other, from the other guests, is, I mean, that was, de that's definitely the biggest part. But the second part is like me trying to articulate my thoughts so people can learn from the stuff that I've learned has made it. So I learn more because I have to think about how I was doing things or how I was looking at things. And it's just, it's really interesting. Doing your, uh, your mountain hunting workshop that you just mentioned, 
when you like mentioned that the great gap you saw between people like that really tests like how well you can put into like words and like articulate ideas because you got to cover all those different people and there's going to be people who you know pick up on it right away but still to like explain it to all those different tiers you got to really you know have that sorted out in your head to make that available to everyone yeah it it, it is it is kind of difficult and the way i kind of looked at it was like all right let's start out with you know, when I put up the slides and I have my bullet points, it's going to be very basic level stuff that, you know, in my head, it's like, oh, you know, everyone probably knows that already, but they don't, you know, not everyone does know that. And you start with that and then that generates conversation that'll yep. go deeper, you know, so you start with that baseline and then you can go deeper and it might be over the head for some of the over their head, like for some of the newer people to it. But at least they're hearing it and they're getting that baseline. And then maybe once they see it, all of a sudden that clicks in their head like, oh, I remember that being talked about and being able to put the pieces of the puzzle together a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's easier. a great way to go about it, man. Yeah, so that's yeah, that's definitely that's cool. But so what, talk about like where where you hunt at, like not not giving locations or anything, but like as far as the, the big woods type areas you hunt in, what does that look like? What does like. Get, try to give the listeners and the viewers a picture of what that type of woods looks like. So the vast majority of the national forest stuff up there um, in northeastern Wisconsin, and it gets more vast. So if you head west, north central Wisconsin, way up by Lake Superior, by uh, um, Bayfield County, um, it gets way more vast, more technical big woods. Like you would imagine like in Maine, right, where you have areas with without many roads. Um, the big wood stuff that I'm hunting in northeastern Wisconsin is, I mean, fairly accessible. Like there's old logging trails every mile, two miles, three miles. It's hard to go for a stretch of four or five miles where there's not some old logging trail to walk in on. So it's it's fairly accessible big woods. A lot of it is gated roads. So it's walking in only, which I love because you can outwork somebody on that kind of stuff. Um but what it is, is there's definitely elevation changes. It's nothing like out east. Um, I know you guys got mountain areas up in Pennsylvania that you hunt a lot. We've got, I'd say, maybe max 250, 300 foot elevation changes. So there's definitely some big ridge, steep ridgy areas with rocks. Um, a lot of mature hardwoods, our mature hardwoods have basically red oak. We don't really have any white oak up there. Um, a lot of red oak, and then that's all mixed with creek bottoms and river bottoms, which are like real small streams, lots of canary grass and alders, brushy stuff that give way into hemlock and cedar swamps. Um, so a lot of cedar swamps, dark green cover, you know, conifers, transitions that are all alder, thick, brushy stuff that go up into the hardwoods. So that's mainly the kind of terrain. And then we also have, you know, logging operations. It had been untouched for a long, long time. Um, there was no logging in the national forest there, but I was explaining to you before the show, um, in 2019, we had a really, really powerful windstorm, like 100 mile an hour straight line winds came through and leveled, well, not leveled, but, you know, quite a bit of destruction on the mature trees, especially oaks, because oaks just don't bend. So like when the wind hit them with foliage on, they just snap all like the bendable stuff yeah. pretty much made it. So a lot of softwood trees made it, but, uh, about 150,000 acres went went over got pushed over and then they've been doing a good job of cleaning it up so they brought in logging crews like crazy they're salvaging the wood that they can and making some great deer habitat for us to go explore so uh, that's that's about the terrain uh we've been into there are clear cuts especially now um older clear cuts popple yeah. slashings you know that are intermixed with hardwoods and swamps but uh that's that's the vast majority of the area that we're hunting there's really no cattail marshes up there uh, nothing like that. So that's about what we got. Yeah. So those, those cedar swamps that you're talking about there, like what, explain what those are exactly. Cause someone was asking me about them before someone had reached out and was like, Hey, I'd love to hear, you know, somebody come on and talk about oh. cedar swamps a little bit. And I was like, I wasn't really even sure <laughs> what, how to define that or what so that our was. cedar swamps which is where i spend a lot of time in these cedar swamps uh, any low area right um what it is it's all sphagnum moss which is green wet moss covers the entire surface of the swamp and then it's all cedar pole timber so it's literally cedar it's all open understory and then the the whole top is filled up with cedar branches so the deer love wintering there um 
you know, great thermal cover. The wind doesn't get in there barely at all. Um, and then the cedar, um, oh gosh, I, what the heck falls off a of cedar? You like know what I needles, mean? They don't have really needles, needles, but it's almost yeah. like the seeds from the cedars will drop and the deer will feed on those a little bit. Uh, but they can be huge. Like there's a couple of cedar swamps up by us that it's just all the same elevation for the most part. Talking like two, three foot changes in elevation, little islands here and there. But it's basically all just green moss, quiet as could be, super soft, wet moss with a wet underbody. And I mean, there's some swamps that are 600 acres of just monotonous cedar. Some of them are smaller. Anytime you've got like a little creek bottom, you'll always have like that grass and alders and that usually gives way into cedars. So all of a sudden it, it, there'll be a transition where you've got thick alder, like little, you know, thumb to wrist size trees growing up all over. And then that'll transition into cedars. That's the main lowland up there is, is a cedar swamp. Okay. And, and you, so couple things there like when you're talking about the moss covered ground and stuff is it like can you walk through it is it's not you're not going to sink like it's, up it's to not like a floating there, yeah right? it's not floating it just retains moisture so a lot of times the year it'll have standing water but the standing water is usually not deep a couple inches deep you know what i mean okay. and then there's lots of time of the year if the fall if it's not a super wet fall it'll typically be dry so you can sneak around in these cedar swamps without making much noise um which is really nice uh you can sneak around and deer trails are really visible and the deer definitely spend time on the edges of those cedar swamps. That's what I was going to ask when you're talking about, you know, these giant areas, <clears throat> 600 acres of this kind of stuff. And you, you're saying that you like to spend a lot of time there. So what, what, what do you look for? You're looking for edges or what, what are you looking for with that? Um, ideally, ideally what you're looking for, it's just like any terrain, right? It doesn't matter if it's a cedar swamp, whatever you're looking for those, those changes, so ideally the best spots I've found have been when there's some sort of change internally, whether that's some sort of elevation change. I'm thinking one spot I used to hunt that I did very well in had this slight rise and it wasn't so slight that the ground dried up, but there was young pine trees growing there, spruce trees in the cedar swamp. So there was a bit of light coming in the canopy and there was a thin strip, maybe 10 yards, 15 yards wide that ran for 80 yards toward the edge of the swamp where it transitioned. And for whatever reason, just that slight change, those deer were using that both sides of it to cross the cedar swamp, to come on and off the hardwood ridges. So I had a stand inside that right on the tip. So I'm looking in the cedar swamp and that was my opening day spot for Wisconsin's gun season because tons of people would hunt around the edge of the cedar swamp, right? They'd sit up on a hardwood blind, looking down at the swamp, hundred yards above it. And when they'd all go get lunch, I shot five bucks, five years in a row between 10 and two sitting in the middle of that cedar swamp because they, you know, they'd kick does, the bucks would follow does and those deer would just use that point where they were on the edge to cross into safety. So it was that little change that was close to the edge and how it related to the edge was awesome. Um, I've also found some spots where, like I mentioned the windstorm, but there was a couple spots in that big, expansive 600 acre cedar swamp. There was a couple spots where I don't know how, but wind must have blown down just small little sections. So it'd be like a 68, 60 yard section, 40 yards wide, where everything started tilting, right? Got yep. hit real hard with wind. And then as those came down, you became loaded with brows and you would be able to sit, you know, between two of those or between the edge and one of those. And the deer would bed all around those blowdowns in that monotonous cedar swamp browse on that stuff and then they'd head out on either edge that you're close by so my favorite thing to try to find in those cedar swamps is edges are great especially as they relate to like you know the start of a ridge or something like that but if you can find some sort of internal structure that those deer are relating to close to an edge that's like yeah funny spot no that I mean and that's that's very comparable to even when you look at logging cuts because you know everyone knows about the edges of logging cuts and that's where a lot of hunting pressure is and it sounds like the same with the cedar swamps and you can find those those internal edges or those in, those little changes that are inside of that monotonous area that that can you know really pay off and that's like stuff that I'm I'm assuming you can't really even tell you know from an aerial map you can't find that no, you can definitely can't tell on an aerial map, um, especially those little like fringe edges of spruce or pines. Definitely can't see those. Um, but like you mentioned, man, you know, people are getting better and better and better. Like 
we have islands in these cedar swamps that are like high ground with hardwood trees, similar to like how, you know, Dan Infault talks about islands and cattails, same idea. But man, every time I've ever found one of those isles of islands and expected to be like, oh, this is going to be, there's always some hunter sign there, like, because they yeah. see them on the aerial, you know, they see it too, or on the topo. So those little like subtle changes and how those relate to the edges, man, those are my favorite places to look for as far as cedar swamps go. Yeah, I bet, I bet you'd be able to, um, be able to find some of those little high rises too, with using LIDAR, um, in some of that, you know, basically taking away all that timber and being able to find some of those little micro areas of rising ground there. Not to, not to expose that, but no, no, <laughs> to anybody I, listening, but the, it's probably worth took the time and you found a, you know, a large area of it and you took the time to take, to flip it and look at that. I think that'd probably be one of the best ways to pick spots to go scout. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and what about like, do you find, what kind of sign do you find in those areas? Like, you know, do you, because it's kind of swampy there, are you finding scrapes and rubs and what do you, what do you typically find? Um, they don't typically scrape in that moss, that sphagnum moss. I've seen some, but it's not, not a normal, you know, they're not going to have a huge community scrape unless it's some kind of dynamite travel area. They'll make it work, but it's not nearly as prevalent as like, you know, you get, you follow that to the edge of the hardwoods, you're probably going to find some scrapes. Um, but they, yeah, they de definitely love rubbing the cedars, very soft bark. So they're really easy to shine up. Like you can see a cedar tree that the deer maybe rub for 30 seconds and it looks like huge because they're so soft, Yeah, but uh, they definitely rub in there. But as soon as you get to those, you know, obviously those edges, um, like that little pocket with blowdowns, as soon as that regrowth comes up, you get those alders. We could, we, I call them alders. I don't even know what they're really called, but anywhere it's down wet, you know, they're like, they kind of grow at angles. And man, they, they'll yep. tear those up like crazy. So all of a sudden you'll see a whole bunch of those bright red, orangish color, all their rubs as soon as you get around those little transition lines or those little thick pockets. So they'll rub in the cedars, but a lot of those swamps have been around so long that, you know, the cedars are all huge and they don't really huge. make sign. They're just traveling the edges of it and relating to the edges. Okay. That, yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And, and it's, I've always found it's so difficult to hunt those flatter areas. Like I, I, I mean, I struggle. There's some, there's, you know, like I talk about hunting, you know, the quote unquote mountains a lot, but there's a lot of areas I hunt that don't have a lot of terrain too. And Pennsylvania has got such a variety where they have more big wood stuff that I can go miles of flat ground basically and some swamps and stuff that's mixed in with you know maybe a couple hundred feet that goes down to a creek bottom and up the other side and those areas are tough they're tough to mm -hmm. find I mean, you really have to pay attention to those subtle edges and in vegetation like it sounds like what you have to do you know from a lot of that standpoint because areas with terrain in my opinion are easier to funnel deer movement they're not as easy to access a lot of times and it's physically more difficult to get into these places but you can predict the deer movement a little bit better yeah i would agree um that's why you know and it's it's nothing new this is what hunter's been doing forever is finding those edges but finding where those multiple edges like anywhere flat the more edges you have that come in or the more you know slight changes in terrain that's all you have to work with so the guy's got to put as many of those to work as you possibly can yeah yeah, that, that, that definitely makes sense. And, and so explain a little bit more about, you know, the, the cedar swamps, but you were talking about those creek bottoms with the alders and stuff in there. How, what do you think about those types of areas? So those areas are, t I mean, you're almost always going to find an edge. So like the inside or what I would call the inside of the cedar swamp that's going to be closest to the creek. It's going to have those alders on it. It's going to have a nice thick edge, which typically up there gives way to some kind of grassy area. And I don't know, this is probably the only thing I've ever gained from watching and reading the old magazine stuff, like in watching the old hunting videos, um, is like every time in the, any video or article that there was like grass, like yellow canary grass stuff, there was always bucks. And then the couple times that I was like able to find patches of yellow canary grass up in the North woods, and anytime I'd walk them, man, I either kick one out of there or there would be rubs around it. I'm like, there really is something to this grass. Like these bucks love grass. So I absolutely still think that's spot on. Like you get up there and there's expanses of grass, but if you can find a high hump in there or, you know, where they're crossing some of these grassy areas, I've always seen deer 
when I've sat the edges of these open grassy areas because they don't see hunters out there. The guys are hunting the other edge of the cedar swamp up in the hardwoods where they can see forever and it's easy to get to. But if you can get down through there, man, I've, I've had really good luck um, hunting edges of cedars where you can see out into some canary grass. Um, I think the bucks definitely like to bet on those thicker edges, like by the cedars, by the alders. And then they got two great escapes through the cedar or they can head toward whatever waterway it is into the alders and grass. But the grass always seems to be key. The taller it is, the thicker it is, the more likely it's going to hold some some sort of buck for the area. Oh man, like that, that grass. And that's, that's so true too. I guess I didn't think about that as it relates to like the old videos and stuff, but I, I see that and I'm thinking of a particular spot in my head. That's, <clears throat> that's big woods that, that I hunt. That's not very steep. It's pretty flat. You get into this, this Creek bottom and there's just this grass and then there's, it's not alders where we're at, but it's like a bunch of beach brush and um, uh, what's it called? Invasive species, buckthorn and stuff just grows nasty thick all around it. But you find these little open pockets of this grass and like right on those Crick bends and stuff, there's always like crossings there and they love in that grass. And I've shot probably two or three bucks in one of these spots in particular, I can think of in that grass as they kind of weave in and out there. The does like to bed in it a lot. I found that and it looks like kind of open when you're looking, yeah. you know, and, but it's high enough where it gives them that little bit of cover and security. And, uh, I know they, it definitely seems like they eat that grass too. I, I don't know the different types of, it. I'm not very good with the different types of grasses, but they, they eat, especially in the summertime I see in like early season there they spend, and I find a lot of sheds in those types of areas too. Um, yeah, that's funny. You mentioned the eating part. Cause like the tall yellow stuff that we have, I think they might, maybe they browse on that earlier in the season, but it gets like you know, real dry and brittle later. And I don't yeah. think they eat that, but man, underneath that tall canary stuff, especially as you get closer, like the little creeks and check this the next time you scout, maybe you have it too. There's always like these little green shoots that grow up at the bases that like the canary grass, like shields and the deer always like, they put their head down in there. I'm like, what are they doing? I'm pretty sure they like to feed on whatever little plant that is that's growing up underneath that canary grass. I, I call it canary grass. I don't know what uh. it's called. But I've seen them doing yeah. that, and I like went and looked. And there's all little green grass. That, you know, it's real small, three, four inches. But they seem to feed on that where they can. No, we do have that. We also get this like viney stuff that, and it's almost like there's. Oh, I know some of it's dewberries, but that's more in the swampier type areas. But these vines and stuff that grow through, and they they tend to love to eat that later in the season. Like you said, that those grasses, like once it gets later. They're brown, they're brittle. I, I don't really see the nutritional value yep. or that it would taste very good. You know, it's kind of like you, you have, you know, you have fries in the, in the air fryer <laughs> and they get to a point where they just turn brown and crusty and just break apart and black. And it's just like, yeah, that's not very good. Anymore, There's probably but... <laughs> some in our air fryer upstairs right now that look like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, just like, uh, just like the uh, nutritional value of it though, I've, also found and not necessarily up north but uh in an area that i hunted in near peshigo which is a little bit further south um which is like a huge harbor area it's like a big lowland area off of lake michigan and it's real flat monotonous grassy like that but man as soon as soon as you get a little bit of cold weather and things start to freeze up a little bit i notice the deer kind of just vacate those areas and like late season if i've been on a buck somewhere and I, like have all these plans to go in there after i'm late there's, it's pretty void of deer because that grass is kind of like settled and no longer provides, you know, the protection, the thermal protection that it did if it's not too tall. And the deer just kind of get yeah. out of there and then they find, you know, interior transitions in the woods a bit more or along a cedar swamp. And they kind of vacate that grass as the season goes on. Yeah, and they, they, have, they get, get back in the conifers and everything there that gives them more of that weather protection yep. too, it's, it seems like. No, that, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. That's, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. And I, cause I was trying to visualize it. And before we got on the call today, I was like looking at areas up there just from an aerial map and kind of getting the feel for the area. And it's a, uh, it's pretty neat looking country. And it's really, I mean, it's, it's definitely a lot different, but there's still a lot of the same similarities that, that you see. And so what, what time of year do you, is your favorite to like hunt in, in the big woods? Oh. Like what, what, what do you like to do in your, your kind of tactic strategy there for it? I, I mean, I, my favorite time of year to hunt, I think anywhere 
is that like last week in October. I really love that when, and it doesn't always work out, but like I love to do, you know, my postseason scouting and find these areas where bucks were in there hot and heavy. And then when you can go back to a spot the year later and like you see a couple fresh rubs or a scrape that's ripped up and you're like, it's paying off. Like I know where this buck is. I'm going to get him. And then you get a chance to like get them on those, those patterns late in the, late in October when they start getting on their feet a little bit more. Um, that's my favorite. Um, I have had not, not a big one opening weekend up there. Our season opens around September 15th. It's always like the second Saturday. Okay. So it's pretty darn early in the whitetail season. Um, I've seen a couple really good ones that just haven't presented shots. So as much as I hate mosquitoes and like, you know, trying to get somewhere in 90 degree weather and like make it happen. Um, I've had a bit of luck trying to get on them early season. So I don't, I don't mind it. Um, rut up in the big woods. I absolutely hate I, this is my least favorite thing. I would rather go somewhere else to be honest, because it's like what I hear a lot of like Eastern hunters do. And like, you know, where if you sit the same spot, this great travel spot, but you sit it like seven days in a row, eventually you'll get one. And like, I can't do that. Like that's, yeah. I don't mind sitting all day, but like, I'm like, nope, I'm on to the next spot. Like, so I'm not good yeah. at the, like when they get wily and they start running, man, there's so much ground they can run. that if you don't have like a great, great terrain feature, it's really tough with the bow. Like it's really tough. So that's, yeah. I actually no, don't I like mean, hunting that's... the rut. <laughs> Well, no, that's, I mean, that's, I think that's important for, for people to recognize like within themselves, like, what do you like, you know, what do you like to hunt and what do you, cause if it's like, oh, if you don't like hunting the rut, that's just, that's fine. Like you just, that's you just focus on the other times of the year and try to try to make it happen. Cause that's not fun. I mean, it's not fun all the time to sit there and not see a single deer for days on end. And how, what, yeah, well, what is the deer density like there? Um, we're, it's not great, but it's coming back. Um, when I was a kid, man, there's this spot we used to hunt that it, you'd see like 20 some deer on opening day. And a lot of them are getting pushed by other hunters because there's so many hunters in the woods. But you used to see deer. And for a while, the last 15 years, it was pretty darn low. Lots and lots of doe tags and people shooting deer and wolves uh, came into the area pretty bad. Uh, it's coming back now since we've had all those uh, blowdowns and windstorms. And now there's some logging in there. Uh, the population is coming back, but yeah, it's, it's definitely lower density than probably anywhere else in the state, except for the far Northern reaches. Uh, the wolf population up there is really, really high and they, they have a terrible, terrible population up there. Uh, we're pretty lucky that we still have fairly decent as far as like national forest goes. It's not terrible. Um, if you know what you're doing, you can see some deer. It's not going to be every single sit most likely for sure. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, if you put your time in, you'd be able to see some deer. Yeah. And, and yeah, that, the wolves, that's a whole nother, that's something we don't deal with in Pennsylvania. So that's like a whole nother aspect of it. Is it, um, you know, in like some of the areas you're into, are they, do they go into your thought process or your planning at all? Or do they, like, when you see them come into an area, does it, uh, does it throw the deer off and their patterns and everything? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, it definitely does. Um, just to the north of us, maybe 30 or 40 miles, there's some pretty established wolf packs like that have been there. And I feel like the deer have kind of figured that out and like, you know, work around them. And of course the wolves will still move with them, but we're in an area where sometimes those wolf packs, like maybe not are established, but they'll come through. And what I've noticed is like when there's not a pack living right there, like the deer are way more like wary because it's something they're not used to, right? So like all of a sudden it's something new wolves come through a couple of wolves. They're like out for like a while and changing everything and then they'll go back. But uh, yeah, it's, it sucks because <laughs> the wolves got to do what they got to do. They got to eat. I get that. Go, you know, but man, when deer are hunted 365 days a year by better predators than us, <laughs> it makes them a lot more wary and makes it a lot harder for a guy who's trying to go up for a weekend to get on a deer it does make it more yeah. difficult, man. They, they are on their toes. Oh, I can no, that's, that's a hundred percent true. And it's funny because that you mentioned about like the places that have the established packs and how they get used to it. I mean, you see that all over, like in places where, you know, wolves have been forever around elk, those elk get used to it. 
But as soon as they're reintroduced to an area, it, they wipe them out yeah. because they don't know that they're even a predator. And it was like, you know, even that way when they introduced coyotes to Pennsylvania, like they weren't here for a while, even in the 80s and stuff. I remember my grandpa telling me, I think it was like around 1990, 91, 92 or something. It was like the first time that I didn't, they started seeing coyotes. I didn't know that at and, all. Yeah. And because um, I remember they had um, – they had shot a couple coyotes and it was like, and they were like, what the heck? Like, what are these? Like, you know, it was just like, yeah. you know, what, what, <laughs> what, you know, what is this? And like, you know, they were just putting a damper on, on the deer and everything. Cause the deer didn't know anything about them. And they would just, you know, some of the younger deer and stuff would do it. And then I would go to a place like when I was up hunting in Alberta, there's a ton of coyotes and the deer pretty big bodied as it is. And like, you, they just co-mingle in the fields together. It was normal. It was just like, yeah. it was normal. It's like, okay, they've kind of figured out like, all right, yeah, what's up? You know, I actually watched Boxer run some coyotes off, like just like get out of here. I'm trying to eat. Don't bother me <laughs> sort of deal. And it's just funny to see how like the deer and animals kind of, you know, respond to the different predators and, you know, depending on how they are. But it, it's just like – you know, I've talked to people like when I talked to Troy Pottinger in Idaho where he's dealing with grizzly bears and wolves and mountain lions. And it's like that's those deer are are naturally going to be more weary because they have to deal with those predators all the time. Yeah, they have to be right. Otherwise, they're not around. Like, yeah, it, it definitely makes somewhat of a difference. But like I said, uh, the area that we spend most of our time, we're pretty lucky. It's not terrible. Like there's other areas that are way worse than what we have. So I'm not trying to complain or sound like a wire. Yeah. Like it could be worse yeah. for sure. Uh, we're, we're lucky that we still got a few deer around. So, um, we've <laughs> Do got, you see them at all. Um, I've not seen one in, in person during hunting season. I've seen one or two in person, uh, crossing fields and whatnot, like driving around closer to town tracks and scat. Yeah. All the time, uh, trail cameras once in a while. Um, strangely enough, they frequent bear baits a lot. So we can bait bear, uh, sorry, bait for bears here in Wisconsin. And if you run any kind of bear bait, you can't use meat, but like they smell all those bears going in there. They'll go check it out. So you get a lot of pictures of wolves on like a bear bait trail cam. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> we've gotcha. Got, we've, are, are they, are they protected there? Wolves? It's yeah. gone back and forth. They were friendly, federally protected for a while. And then we had a hunting season for like two years and the quota was met in like, the first day, like the quota, like 135 wolves first day quota was filled to so like, Oh my God, like we have way more wolves. And then they got protected again. So right now they're currently protected, no hunting season. Uh, it's been a quite a battle back and forth between, you know, all the forces that be to try to figure out what to do with them. Cause there's a lot of people that would like to see them managed a bit more than what they are, but. Yeah. And I, I like your attitude with it though. It's like, wolves yes it's not the best for deer hunting but wolves are wolves and they got to do their thing too it's like but they also need managed and it can't like take the emotion into it of like oh this mystical creature yeah. like we don't want to see them get killed yet yeah, yet yeah, but like they still need to have you know managed populations and there's not an apex predator above them that's going to manage them, exactly you know so it's like not that like human you know, management practices are the end all be all, but that's what we got. And we manage every other species pretty much in our state. We can't have the apex predator be unmanaged. Like there has to be something to that, right? Like it's not going to work if we don't. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah. I, I agree with that hundred percent. And what, so you, you, when I think of Wisconsin and I think anybody thinks of Wisconsin, you know, it's the number one state as far as the biggest deer killed, you know, in the, in the country, you know, as far as that goes. And I know like most of that isn't from like the regions you're talking about, no, it's not. Uh, but what do you, <laughs> what do you see as far as quality of deer um, uh, in some of those that's areas? That's a great question. Um, so my dad and I have been running trail cameras since they came out. So my first trail camera, I think I got when I was like 10 or 11 and it was like made by trail timer, the company that used to like have the string you would pull out across the trail. They came out with like a 35 yes. millimeter camera. So we used to run film cameras, you know, then we switched. So we've run cameras a ton and man, we've gotten lots of buck pictures and there's been very few, what I would call big, big bucks up there. So there are good ones, man. There, there are good ones. They're around. 
we have a great older age class, you know what I mean? Like probably like what you have in PA and you get into some of these areas that are difficult to hunt. And like, I can't find a five-year-old buck anywhere near where I live now. And like, there's way more deer, but I can go up North, hang a trail camera and get a mature buck on it in like a week. Right. Like there's big ones up there. Yeah. As far as antlers go, we had one buck that we chased for four years. We got a match set of sheds off him. His sheds went 158 and change without spread. So that was a big deer. That was wow. one of the biggest deer we ever had on camera. He was huge. Pretty sure he actually died in that windstorm because my buddy had a trail cam picture of him in the summer in velvet. And then we, no one ever saw him after that windstorm. A um, couple nice deer, but most of them are like most of these deer on the wall in the back, except for that big one. He was from Illinois. Um, these other ones are all from okay. up there, National Forest. I'd say like 130 inch buck is a real nice buck up there. Like if you get a 130 on the National Forest, that's that's a really really good deer. Yeah, no, I mean that that's uh that's very similar. I mean, I guess that's very similar to Pennsylvania too. Like that's you get these older age bucks, but to get that next level antlers like you see in a lot of the other areas in the Midwest and around ag country, it's just it's very very rare. They're there but just not, not in very good numbers. That's, you know, difficult. It's difficult to be able to find them. Yep. You know, like someone was just asking me the other day, they're like, what, you know, what's the biggest buck that you've had on trail camera? And, and I know, I know how big it was because it was one that my ex-girlfriend shot when <laughs> we were hunting it and, and it was 178 inches, but like that I've, I know it's huge, but like, I've never, I've had a couple of other bucks on camera that I've hit that probably 170 mark. Um, but that is very, very rare. And that's like, you know, I'm running 40 some cameras a year. And to do that, you know, if I find a buck that's above 140 in an area, that's, that's a big, that's deer, a huge, you know, and it's like a huge deer to go at like, right. And yeah. And a lot of the mature deer are 115 to 130 inches and they really don't get much bigger than that. Like some of the, some of them don't, they just like, they will be a nice Pennsylvania eight pointers we call it. And they just might get heavier mass, but they're still with the six inch tines and that's just what they're going to be. And, uh, uh, so it's, it's kind of funny when you, when you think about that and that's why I was wondering, I was interested like in you know a state like Wisconsin, I know I'm pretty sure Minnesota is kind of similar to that too. Yeah from what i've minnesota been and wisconsin both have the same thing going on where like northern minnesota and northern wisconsin very similar vast the train's very similar um they've got a little bit more wolves they got moose up there but uh you get down to southeastern minnesota along the mississippi and western wisconsin buffalo county along the mississippi and it totally changes right like you get all these huge bluff country where the rivers and glaciers have left all of these minerals and nutrients and all of a sudden, it's the same type of deer in the same state, but they're growing into 10-pointers as two-year-olds or one-year-olds, whereas up here, most of the bucks never see 10 points in their life. <laughs> like, there's only yeah. a six-pointer or an eight-pointer forever, right? So it's just totally different yep. as far as, like, you know, the nutrients that these deer are getting. Yeah, no, that's that's, <clears throat> that's totally it. But I think it, I think that, like, the, the people like us that go and hunt these types of areas, like, if we wanted to just focus on the biggest antler deer, we'd go somewhere else. Like it's, it's definitely about the experience, at least for me, like of like getting to hunt these places and getting to hunt deer and kind of their natural habitat and, and just going to places where you don't deal with people for the most part and sounds and lights and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's totally the adventure aspect of it, right? Like you got to not just be a deer hunter, but you want to get like, you want to challenge your thought process, like your physical, like that's the fun part of it. That's why people get like hooked onto it. And that's why you were saying before, like you have listeners who travel to hunt these areas, even though they're not like big buck destinations, it's because like you got something in here that you want to like test, you want to test yourself. And like, that's why I keep going back to it. I live three hours away from our cabin now, but every chance I get to go like scouting or like go look for sheds up there, I'm like, I just miss it. Like, I love it up there. It's just different. It feels different. Yeah. And it's like, like looking at your wall behind you, like those ones you shot in Northern Wisconsin, like those are big deer, great deer. And then you see that one from Illinois in the background and that's another caliber, <laughs> of deer, you know, and it's like, like, that's awesome. But it's like, it's, it's still so much fun to just like, 
like go and like now with with me like i have more time that i could travel to some of these big buck states and be able to do that and i still find myself like oh i don't have time in november because i know i need to put two weeks into <laughs> pennsylvania season it sounds wacky to say that you know no, i totally it's like okay it. i could draw I could draw Iowa this year. I'm not even putting in because I'm like, oh, I want to hunt Pennsylvania and, and West Virginia and like these mountain areas and these big woods areas. And like, cause it's so much fun to, to do that. That too. is, that is the most fun. You know, it's a challenge and man, you've killed some really good bucks the last few years. I've been following you, man, for what you did on there. Nothing will beat the feeling of those ever, right? Like you could go to yeah. Iowa next year and shoot a giant on your first day. It's not, I mean, it'll be awesome but it won't feel like the feeling you had when you took one off your Pennsylvania public lands. It just won't feel the same. Yeah. No. And it's just like, and it's not like, it's, it's not for me like, Oh, this is harder. And it's like a chest pumping thing. It's just like, I just love that experience so much more at this point in my life of just like going into this just vast country and trying to figure it out and just like going through it. <clears throat> it's, it makes your head spin as much as like, it seems like I have it put together. I don't like it. Like, you go into these places and it's like, what, why, you know, you get a picture of his big deer. He's like, where's he living now? Where's he coming from? It's just like this, this constant, like learning and trying to figure it out. It's just, it's, it's crazy. And you brought up the, the old cameras. Like, so I never ran the ones with the trip wire type deals, but my dad had those that would timestamp. Yep. And then when I got into it, it was the 35 millimeter ones. And we go down to CVS like uh, to, to get the photos developed and you'd pay for the one hour oh, photo yeah. and sit there and wait. And that's what we were just talking about at Easter, actually, with uh, my dad, and my uncles. They were talking about when they everybody like that was like the big buck hunters in the area. They'd, we'd be all sitting in our car you know, <laughs> waiting for the one hour photo to be developed. And like, you know, you had 24 photos you could get on this on this roll. And, but you'd pull that roll even after 18 photos because you didn't want to go back in and it'd be filled up. So you'd like be wasting like six pictures, but it didn't matter because you're like, I, I had to see what's on here. And it's like, doe, 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 fern moving, you know, doe, doe. And then it's like one buck and it's like like a side view. And you're like, oh my gosh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> 100%, man. That was the same, same experience as we had. And um, you just think back to all the different, you know, just how far it's come. And one of the, the biggest like learning curves I had was I had this buck that my dad actually saw in person first. He was scouting this area and he like got to this edge is actually this uh, cedar swamp spot. I was talking about before that had this little spruce line. My dad found that spot. He was scouting the cedar transition and he like saw a deer in the cedars, just the horizontal backs. We kind of like hunkered down and he ended up seeing four bucks that were just like walking around in this little like pocket. And he didn't know what was going on, but there's a couple nice ones. He's like, oh, we got to go back and check this out. So I ended up hunting that spot both season, seeing some bucks. And then I turned that, I stole his spot like any good son would do. And uh, yep. turned that into to my gun spot. And I kicked him out of it, actually. Because I know how my dad is. He's a great hunter. But he, he wants to always know what's going on. So he'll go back like to his good spot and walk around and see how it looks before he's going to hunt it like two or three times, see how it's looking. And I'm like, dad, did, did you appear like they know and they just like they don't have to go far to be out of your danger zone where they smell you. So like, just don't go walking. Just like scout your way in, you know, and set up and hunt like what everybody does now. But like this is like a while back. And yeah. uh, so I took over the spot. I'd never let him go back there, you know, stay out of there. And I would only hunt it opening day of gun season. And I shot those five bucks in, in a row. But the buck I was hunting back, there was a six pointer. And this is where you probably enjoy this. But I had pictures of him for five years, never grew more than six points. But Bo, his brow tines were about eight inches and they're about a foot apart. And he just came up and forked most impressive looking six pointer you could ever imagine. I saw him three times with Bo in hand. And once during gun season, but never got a shot. But in the time that I got to hunt him, man, I learned so many lessons up there. Like, don't grunt like an idiot when the deer can see in open area. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I had him coming down kind of toward me in the hardwood. I got so excited. Two grunts on the grunt call. He stood there for like five minutes looking. And I was like, oh, crap. This is pretty open. Like, he can see. Took off. I was like, dang it. <laughs> never, <laughs> never call in the open stuff. 
Yeah. It, 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 how true is that? Like, and, and sometimes you go into that like panic mode. Like I, I had that. I remember when I was hunting this buck, I called Hercules and he was one that hit was close to 170 inches. And last day of the season, I'm sitting in the tree in this creek bottom with some of that grass stuff there this before right on the bend of the, the stream. And he just comes walking right down the middle of this open, not where I thought he was going to come from. And he's coming right to me. And what do I do? I grab my grunt call, like while he's 80 <laughs> yards from me in the wide open. And, you know, and I hit the grunt call and he's just like, I'm going to do a big loop around through this thick stuff and go downwind of them at that point, you know? So he did a loop and I'm like, you idiot, yeah. you know, you're thinking <laughs> in your head, like, why did I call at that, at that particular you know time? It's like, like I'm a big proponent of like blind calling and doing that, but it's gotta be, you can't do it when they're, when they can see right where you're at and it's open. But I mean, I've been in the same position where like that moment that you've been waiting for and you just want to make it happen. And that's like one of the things that I learned <laughs> bow hunting, like later in life, like I always used to like want to try to make it happen so bad to like get to the end point that I'd like rush stuff, right? Like not thinking about when to call or like rushing my shot. Cause like, I just, you know, got to get them down. This is your chance. And I used to rush it a lot. And like, it cost me a couple of good bucks up there with the bow like shoulder shot because i was like rushing because i just you know you wait so long for a chance in the big woods like you wait so long you just i put so much pressure on myself to make it happen just make it happen get up get up and i would like rush when i really i should just be taking my time and if it happens it happens but as a young guy who wanted to get the big buck i like couldn't slow down could not slow down yeah it, yeah it it I, I mean i i still str I, i'm getting better with it but i still struggle with that like if i could have back all the things that i've screwed up because of rushing something you know whether it's the shot or just making a move that's stupid like it's like man like i i can even think of it when i was elk hunting the first first year or two i was elk hunting and i saw this elk in this wallow and he's you know he's throwing mud on himself and i hit a call and he starts coming and then i i he like went up the bank a different way, not knowing that was the only way out of the wallow. And I thought he was trying to circle me and I like get up and I move and I like try to like cut him off. And it's like, just be patient. Like sometimes you can't force things to, to be able to happen. And it's like, and it's knowing when to, when you need to like, you know, make that shot in a short period of time. And when you have a lot more time than you think you do. And it's like, that takes experience. And I think it's really hard to articulate that in words until you've experienced it, you know? And it, and it changes because sometimes you do need to act fast, right? Like, or your opportunity will be gone. But when you're coming up and like learning it, man, that's so no one can tell you that, right? Like that's like you said, you just no. have to go through a bunch of, really bad mess ups and then get a couple of success ones and be like, all right, I kind of am figuring this out. Cause it's, it's so different. It, it takes experience. It takes just time after time after time of messing it up. So you figure out what the <laughs> hell you're supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. And, uh, so how do you, when you're, when you're in these spots, do you, do you typically drag deer out? Do you cut them up and pack them out? Or what's your method for getting, a deer uh, out of man, we we're stupid and we still struggle dragging deer out. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Like we, we had a law changed a couple of years ago. So you can quarter a deer out now in Wisconsin, as long as the antlers are still on the head, you can quarter them out. But something about just earning that kill and dragging them out and suffering for like four hours. I just, I kind of like it. So so we're we're still pretty <laughs> stupid uh as my dad's going up in years and he's he's got a pretty bad back now so um it makes it tough because you know you can only get like we got some of those carts those wheeled carts which are great for the old logging roads but man uh it, it makes me worry that if my dad gets one or got a bear and he was up there by himself i know how stubborn he is he would try to get it out himself and probably be <laughs> stuck back in the woods but uh yeah we drag him out and um i guess part of growing up too this is kind of a little tangent but we did do a bit of dragging so that buck i got in illinois this year is by far my biggest deer ever um but like a week and a half later was wisconsin's opener and a week later after shooting that big one i shot this thing and i was like almost more happy believe it or not when i shot this because i was up north hunting with my dad and he had just dropped me off in a spot I'd never been to. And I was still hunting in some big hills, like an old slashing. And I saw a whole bunch of deer. And this guy was bedded with a doe. He got up. I was like, that's a decent buck. 
dad's just down the road. He'll get there. Like, we'll drag it out together. So I pulled up, shot, got him down. I was like, this is going to be awesome. So dad came in, called, hey, got one already. He's like, I didn't even park the truck yet. <laughs> so he whipped around and like, I got to like drag this deer out together, which just doesn't happen that much anymore now that I live. You know, I got a family. I got a young family. So it was like almost better than shooting a big one. You know what I mean? Out by myself. Like here I got yeah. to enjoy that with dad. And the OKS Hunter mantra was ringing in my head, you know, like make a memory. Like this was the memory. Like who cares if it's like not huge? Like this is going to be fun. And we had a great time dragging it out together. It was a huge hill. It sucked. It was absolute torture. But we had a lot of fun somehow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. No, that's that's so awesome. And, and the thing about dragging that that uh, is funny that you say that because my family is still like big on dragging deer. Like that's what, you know, you know, as much as we we've, we've I'll, I pack out more deer now and same with my cousin and my brother and stuff. But like the older generation, my dad, and my uncles, it's like drag, drag, drag. And like, and it's also, they're like, don't you want to have it back at camp, you know, hanging there at camp and in the truck bed, people get to see the whole thing rather than just this head and cape that's sitting there on the tailgate. And, and like, and that, that does, you know, I, I remember 2017, I shot one of the biggest body deer that I ever did. And I drug it out by myself. I didn't have cell phone service there. And it was a nasty drag. And I was like, I even had a frame pack with me. Like I totally could have cut it up, but I was like, I got to show these guys the body. I did it in that like, truck. It was, you know, <laughs> Yeah, it was it was a you know 125 inch deer. It wasn't like this giant monster buck, but the body on him was so big in the neck. And I remember dragging him through this logging cut that they had left like all the tree tops oh. down and stuff. And you're going over the logs, and it's like he was missing half the hair <laughs> on him by the time I got him back. Anyways, you know, dragging him. Then I get to my truck and I can't get it up into my truck, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like what am I supposed to do? This is why. You know, that now I drive a, a moderate uh, truck where I had like a big lifted truck then and stuff. And, and I was like, I'm trying to like back it up to a bank and I still couldn't get it up. And, you know, I'm like covered in blood trying to pull it and re- use ratchet straps and everything to try to, you know, t- t- tow that thing up in there. And it's uh, it's so funny. But I love I love the stories and like the, bit, the best thing for me. And it sounds like that you enjoy this part, too, is but like getting that call or like from a family member or friend it's like we got to drag like it's dragging time and it's like man this is awesome like i love that part of hunting season just as much if not more than you know letting an arrow go myself we agree um uh, i was at work it was like november 7th i had actually shot um a really nice buck um that my dad and i had been hunting it's actually this one right here uh, we had pictures of that buck and then an eight pointer for seriously like five seasons in a row we'd get them every summer they always hung together and like we just like get pictures of them in velvet be like oh they're there they're back like those are nice deer and then like all right let's go hunt another area and i was just like why don't we like try to shoot these like we were so like half-heartedly hunting these deer we were like chasing other deer but i was like they're there every year they live there dad so this one season we were like let's take all of our cameras yours and mine and like let's just go photo like camera bomb the area and like let's hunt these deer so that's what we did it like made the whole point was to shoot one of these two bucks and uh so we hung cameras and we were getting their pictures all over but like all the spots in my brain i'm very like hunt by feel and where i think they're gonna be and like all these spots i'm thinking are gonna be like the hot spots they're like walking through at like 12 30 at night and i'm like ah oh, i'm like, all dejected i get up there i got like three days to hunt like friday morning i hunt i got friday off I go check my cameras and he's like, well, he's walking through at midnight, like, no, doesn't even pay to hunt. And I'm like, you know, being all like mopey about it. And my dad's like, you know yep. what? Like, there's this spot. Uh, I just walked the other day. Looked like there was a big buck fight there. Like, let's acorn ridge. It's like a mile from where we'd been focusing. It's like, let's just go try that spot. I was like, yeah, let's do it. So we go in there. I find a big rub line. He's like, yeah, you know, this is where they fought. I see this rub line. I go set up. Lucky enough, this buck comes in. It's the buck that we've been hunting. I get him. Um, got to share it with my family. We drag him out, right? It was really fun. But then a week later, a week to the day later, I had been telling my dad, I'm like, you got to go after the other one. Like, it would be, how amazing if we got both of them. He's like, Derek, you shot like a huge buck with your bow. It's a great season already. Calm down. I'm like, but go get him. Like, it'd be so cool. So he, uh, he calls me, I'm at work and my dad barely calls, like he's not a cell phone guy. And I get a call while I'm teaching 
And I'm like, sorry, kids, I got to take this. My dad's calling. It's like 9 o'clock <laughs> in the morning, November 7th. And he's like, you've got one. I'm like, did you get him? He's like, no, no, it's not him. It's just a really pretty eight-pointer. And the buck that we've been hunting has always been an eight-pointer. Super old, but like 122-inch deer. Never got bigger. And I'm like, well, dad, are you sure it's not him? Because we don't have any pretty eight pointers other than him. Like that's gotta be him. So he's standing over the deer, has no clue it's the deer. I'm like looking at a trail cam picture. I'm like, look at his right G2. Does it blade out a little bit before the tip? He's like, oh my God, it is him. (laughs) (laughs) I wasn't there, but we got to like share the moment on the phone when he realized he actually shot this buck that he'd been hunting forever. Yeah. (laughs) That was that was funny. I still give him crap about that that he didn't even know it. <laughs> that's hilarious. Oh, that's awesome. That's a, what a season that was too, like, to be able to 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 take both of those bucks that you that you were targeting. Like that doesn't happen very often. And then you and your dad to both be able to do wildly it. lucky, man. We just got really really lucky that year. That's no, that's that's awesome. And what about uh, and sometimes that I mean, that's a good thing about like that feel like you get that feel where you just find the spot and you, you know, you had cameras over here and it just wasn't telling you what you needed to. It's like sometimes you just got to go with your gut and <clears throat> go check something out. It's like, oh, I, I don't know why this seems like a good spot, but there's let's say a buck fight and whatever. Like, let's try it. Yeah, man, that's uh, you know how it is. The more time you spend in the woods, the more you just, you know, understand what what the animals do in the terrain and you can predict without ever walking like you can just see up ahead i I bet in that low spot there's gonna be a rub line or a scrape like you just build up that visual repertoire throughout years and years and years of scouting and like that's what i've noticed like because i i'm a student of the game very much like you are so like i look at all these different people who are successful and like what are they really doing and like it comes down to two things in my eyes that like successful big buck killers are doing number one they're making it their priority. So like time, like there is no, like they're not worried about bass fishing or walleye fishing. Like if they have a weekend to go scouting people who like, this is their life. They dedicate so much time to like learning and figuring it out. And the second thing is like, it seems like everyone has some little niche that they are just fanatical about. Um, watching your stuff, like you win map spots, man. Like you're out there checking the wind, how it flows. Like I've never done that. And I don't plan on doing it because it seems so time consuming and finicky. But, like, look at how it's paid off for, like, the stuff you've done. Like, that's fanatical. Paid off. Um, other guys, you know, who focus in on these little missions. Troy Ponger, you mentioned. It's the scrape wizard, right? Like, he has that game dialed. He knows how to do it. He knows how to be successful with it. I'm just, like, a visual, like, rubs. Like, that's what I key in on. Like, I can look at rubs and, like, figure out, you know, what time of year they were made, why it was made, where it was in proximity. Like, was this a staging area outside the bedding? Like, I want to know everything about rubs. Like, that's what I key in on. And that big one I killed, like, my dad showed me where they fought. Well, there's a rub line heading over this oak ridge and went down into thick stuff. The rubs started to intensify. They looked, like, really thrashed and rubbed. I'm like, he's coming up here, staging on the edge of this thick pine timber before he goes out onto the oaks, probably watching for does. Those rubs, like, gave it away because, like, as a visual artist, like, uh, you know, I teach drawing and painting, like I'm a visual person. That's what I key in on. Like my fanatical part is like visually seeing the sign and focusing on our rubs. So like, I don't know, that's like a weird thing, but I just try to pick something up like that from like as many people as I can. I love, I love the way that you explained it. And that, that is so true. You know, like from, you know, myself talking to so many successful hunters and being around them, they all have that thing. Like they all, yeah. Number one is always time. Everyone's, you know, they're they're dedicating the time and then they all have that, that one thing that they, they, they are so serious about and that they focus on and they, and they do that. And it's like, they can recognize things like my, my cousin Mason, He's just like so good with his gut, just telling him what a good spot is. Like he can read an area and not even sometimes be able to put it into words, but just like understand like this is where a buck is going to go. My buddy Johnny Stewart, like Johnny's like he just can visualize how a deer moves through an area. And you see some of his setups and, you know, to to the untrained eye, you know, it's like well, this doesn't have this scrape here it doesn't have this rub here it doesn't have this why is this your spot and he's just like this feels like the spot that that the buck is going to go through and this is you know it just has that 
component that I've seen Bucks do in other places, and it's like everyone's got those things that. They and then just, there's there's they people, sorry to interrupt you, Bo. There's people who are the exact opposite of that, and like who are super analytical. Like I need data. Like you know what I mean? Like the, the data driven guys. I can think of a couple guys who are wildly successful, and it's all based on like data. And then you have someone like your cousin who's like this feels like the spot and like doesn't matter how you do it you just got to get really good at like whatever thing your best like whatever makes sense to you make that everything and eventually like it's you're gonna find success if you get good enough at it right yeah no man that's that is so that is so true too and and you can you can you know repeat those examples across the board i'm thinking of other yep. people and like <clears throat> my dad my dad like i i see his process a lot is like he doesn't hunt like a specific thing all the time but what he does is he still hunts a lot like still hunting on the ground and like he can he that's how he scouts during the season was with bow in hand and he shot more bucks than not off the ground based off of yeah and hunting these areas on the ground and like that's his thing like he's and and i'm trying to get better at it but i'm nowhere near where he's at with being able to know when to go fast know when to go slow and when to take your time and be able to pick those those spots apart and and uh it's it's you know when you look at and that's why i love like just interviewing people like yourself and others that are like successful hunters and just like understanding what makes them tick and how how they read th- you know, locations and sign. And, and it's funny because like not, you know, you're an educator, so you're very good at like being able to articulate your words and be able to, you know, teach what you are doing based off your perspective. You know, not, not a lot of the the big buck killers are (laughs) able to do that. So it's like, you know, it's like you have to like pull it from, like I've spent so much time uh, around uh, a lot of people in my family and I like always am just asking questions or like it takes a lot of time me actually going in the woods with them and seeing what they're seeing and then I'm like oh okay this is this is why they're doing it this way or this is how they're they're doing it it's always like, easier like that organic way when you're in the woods like for okay as hunter Eric was asking we got some gopros and he's like can you film like you know a couple of videos about like some different topics you know that might help people who are learning and I'm like sitting there and I'm like, I just like, what would I talk about? And I was like, can I just like go in the woods and just like talk when I see stuff? And he's like, well, yeah, that'd probably be better. <laughs> Cause like sitting there trying to like explain an idea. I was like, I don't even know where to start. But like you get in the woods, you can all oh, like this, like check this out over here, you know? And then you can show them. But like, I was like, I don't know how to just sit here and talk about it. Like that's, that's weird to me. It's hard. <clears throat> yeah. And that's why, that's why I've like, I feel like I've changed my style of the podcast over time of like trying to get, I feel like when you get someone into a story about something, it's you can learn so much more from it than just to be like, okay, what is your tactic for this? You know, because there's, it's so situational that you can get more out of a story in a situation. And then once you start visualizing that area, now you're able to talk about it and, you know, people can pull from that and be like, Oh, that's, you know, I was doing it the whole time you were talking. Like you'd say something. I'm like, Oh, that's how that relates to this spot yep. that, that I have, or it sounds like it. And, and, uh, it's, it's just interesting on, on that, that perspective of it, but that's pretty neat. I, li- I like the idea, like how you can read rubs like that and rubs of something that I never paid attention to a whole lot. And I've really started, I talked about at the scouting camp a lot. I spent a lot of time around Greg Litzinger, who's a rub fanatic yep. and, and just like understanding rubs and, you know, walking around the woods with him and he's looking at a tree and he's like, all right, look behind it. You see that, how that's just barely nicked back here. Oh, it's probably a long beam buck. Cause he was coming around and doing this and, and this clusters here. He's probably, this is direction of travel. You look at this rub line on this topography line. That's, that's the, the topography line likes to travel on. It's like, okay, that just adds more pieces of the puzzle. Together. You you said uh, my favorite word right there. And I've been talking about it with Eric and the guys and wrote a couple articles on our website there, but rub clusters are like the biggest giveaway to me. Like in the big woods is different than a lot of other areas. Like you hear guys talk about bedding, right. <clears throat> in like farm country and cattail and like bedding is finite. Like there it's here. That's where it is that's pretty easy to hunt. Like you wait for the right wind and you hunt it, but like bedding in the big woods is so difficult because they're just so nomadic and they change all the time. But I tell you, if you can find those pockets, those areas, you know, deer in pockets, we all know this, 
But if you find those little thickets that they like and you start finding those clusters of rubs, I'm talking like multiple rubs in small areas, like that's where I want to invest my time. Like that's like the calling card of like a buck is spending time right here, probably waiting for it to get dark. Like if it's close to thick, he's probably laying somewhere close, getting to a spot where he's got some sort of visual advantage or, you know, thermal advantage where he can just sit it out till it's dark collect thermals or visually scan an area and just rub like show off in front of other deer and kill time till it gets dark you find those clusters that look like heavily worked rubs on alders or you know beach saplings where it's just like thrashed and like broken ones yeah like that deer's not doing that for other deer that deer's killing time and he's there probably in daylight or damn close to it like that's the kind of stuff that i freaking live for like find those spots, figure yeah. out how to hunt it. And like, that's, you're going to be your best chance in the big woods. Like it's not going to be there every day. Right. But like, man, when you find concentrated sign, like that's why it's so hard for me to sit for six days in a row on like a travel, like travel, such a mystery to me. Like, you don't know when they're going to be there. You don't know why they're going to be there, but like, give me some hot rub sign near like thick. And I'm like, I got a reason. Like I will invest time until it happens there. Yeah, and, and uh, so one, one thing I think you brought up a really good point there was about those rub clusters when you find where they snap off like bigger pieces, you know, something that's, you know, the size of your thumb or bigger on those bendy type trees, yeah. you know, the beaches, the alders, the ones that, do you ever try breaking them? Like it's <laughs> You tough. can't break like, it when like you twisting. want to. <laughs> No, and it's like, yeah, exactly. When you when you find when you find a buck that can snap that stuff off, and we were showing that during the scouting camp, we were walking around. It's like, okay, that's not a very big like tree that's rubbed. Like, so you look at it, be like, oh, that's not a big rub, but that's the biggest rub to me because it's like that snapped off. That takes some force. That takes some power. That takes you know some you know everything that you need from a mature buck to be able to do that, and that that gets me excited. Oh, it's a, it's a different game. Illinois is different, but I was down shed hunting with a couple of buddies on the public ground in Illinois where we're hunting. And uh, the last morning, my buddy Bo Bilo, he runs a Ghost Bucks hunting channel on YouTube, does an awesome job. But we're down there, and him and my buddy had to take off for his son's birthday in the morning. And I was like, well, I'm going to sneak in a little walk before I go home. So I went for a walk by myself, did like six miles, and the terrain's beautiful. You know, there's big creek bottoms and little wooded hillsides. And I found this hillside. It was like this slow, steep hillside. It was rather grassy and a lot of like, sumac trees i don't know if you guys have sumacs down by you you know with the yep. little red fuzzy like tops but this whole hillside yep. was like kind of thick full of sumac and i didn't know it then but at the bottom of the hill there was a couple small ridges that were full of multiple multiflora rose bushes so super thick buck bedding was there and they were coming up this hill and i found these areas where i i thought somebody had been in there with like a machete because like these sumacs were all like above the ground i'm like what the heck somebody clear this out go and start looking and there's probably 50 60 rubs some of them were still standing but most of them were ripped snapped twisted off laying all over the ground there was another patch about 20 yards away where these bucks were just coming up out of their bedding maybe 80 yards so it could have been you know during daylight and they were just some buck or multiple bucks were just shredding these little soft trees you know just ripping them up so i'm like holy crap early season i bet you this is the spot. Like this is this. Look at how much time they've invested in this one little tiny patch. He's rubbed like seventy trees. That's had to take weeks. <laughs> yeah, he's really cool looking though. Yeah, really cool. <clears throat> yeah, and those you tend to find like I, I, I those rub clusters. Uh, for me, it's like either right around where he's bedding at, or like that staging spot, like you're talking. And either one of them, it's like he's probably doing a lot of that in daylight. Yeah. You know, because you'll find rub lines. It's like, okay, there's that travel stuff that like you were talking about. It's like, okay, when is that happening? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, But those clusters kind of give you that little bit of better feel that they're spending some time there. Yeah, I think growing up, like, that was the only missing piece. Like, my dad is a great hunter. He's killed a lot of really nice deer up there. Um, got deer every year, like bucks every year. Probably, you know, one bow, one buck a year for a long, long time. So like he knows what he's doing, but dad has always been like very much a travel hunter. Like you tra hunt trails, right? Like they look at this spot, like big trails crossing, lots of trails. And like, as a kid, I was always wondering like, why are they walking down these trails? And like, I could never put my finger on it. Like huge trail. But I'm like, why, where are they going? Like, where are they coming from? Which way is it? 
it just like never really clicked until I like the hunting beast and I learned about like betting and I was like I never even like really thought of that before <laughs> and then it was like oh closer I get to the thick stuff the better chance I have of seeing them oh this is all makes sense and then like the whole world like <laughs> opened up I was like holy shit like this is cool <laughs> yeah yeah that that's that's so true and what was okay so I the last thing I want to ask you about is your cameras what so what are you what are you setting your cameras up on um when you're running cameras so I'm running all cheapies I got the twenty dollar tasco cameras um i run a whole bunch of different kinds over the years and just hunting public you can't beat the tascos like they get the job done if someone takes one it's not a big deal um almost always elevated um not necessarily like theft pre prevention i just don't ever want to put something in the woods that a deer a buck can put his nose on because like you're done like and that's from like hunting the big woods like those bucks smell your camera yep. they don't walk in front of it anymore so like elevate it so they can't put their nose on it and flash doesn't spook them um and then i'm usually just a little bit i try to be like close to where i think they are but i always am trying to set my cameras in like the good areas trying to set my cameras in a spot where i can walk in and check it with a stand on my back and if there's something that says hunt here i can get past it and still have a spot to set up without you know what i mean like going checking a camera and then yep. like not having a spot so i'm almost always hanging a camera with the thought that like if there's something good on it when i check this in october or whenever i need to be able to like go a little bit further and get in that tree right there so like that's always the thought and then if nothing's on the camera you know just keep scouting my way around but i the cameras tend to be in thicker areas um once in a while i'll throw it up in a spot where i think it'll be good just to know what's in the area but typically i'm like close to thick on the edges of thick trying to like figure out where exactly this deer is coming from because you get too far into like i don't run a lot of like big community scrapes i make a lot of like mock scrapes in areas where i'm interested in but those big community scrapes don't tend to tell me like where they're coming from because they're usually later in the in the nighttime in the evening and the direction of travel seems to be more random and like it's good to know they're there love the pictures yeah but really I'm using my cameras way more for like information than I used to. I used to like just getting pretty pictures of like big bucks, right? So like find like <laughs> the best sign, find like a cool spot. I'm going to get a picture here. But now it's really like, I want to know information of like, what's going to help me kill this deer? Like, how can I figure that out? So, so a lot of times your cameras aren't on like a particular sign or like, it's not on a scrape or rubs. Like it might just be like, you might build a scrape there as something to get yep. them to stop or whatever, but you're like finding the kill spot, setting your camera up there. And that's, that's what yep. you're doing. And, your and some of those cameras. And I mean, a lot of your guys and what you've done, like some of them, I don't check in a season. And like, I've hung them over yep. big woods beds before, man, seven or eight years ago, I had some awesome pictures. I found this huge bed on a steep Ridge at the top third looking over this little lake that you know no one ever goes back to and there's a huge rub in it i was like holy crap i just have to know what lays here so i got a camera way up above it and i left it all season and i went back and got it in like december and it was it was amazing this buck we knew about this big 10 pointer he didn't use it all summer i hung it in like june buck uh does fawns little bucks used it and then like october 6th it was the first time he came in and he came in with a small eight pointer, a two year old, and he circled around, they fed, he bedded there. And after that day, no other deer bedded in that bed. It was almost like they smelled him and like no deer bedded in it. Through the month of October, he laid in that bed five times. And I went back to like historical wind data and every day the historical said West Southwest, every time he used it. It was the only days it was West Southwest and it was after season, so there's nothing I could do about it. And you can bet your ass that I went there and hunted on the first West Southwest that next October. <laughs> but uh, yeah. it was like unbelievable. Like it confirmed like everything I'd read about and like thought of, which just doesn't happen in the big woods. Like they don't use beds that consistently. But for that time of year yeah. with acorns close by, it was like, you know, it was everything you would want it to be. If I only knew that then. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it, but it's like, it's almost like one of those things that you get that now you have that information. It's like you find something similar. Maybe you're more apt to tr just try it based off of, you know, that 
historical data, even if it's of a different spot, but it's like, okay, if this spot looks like it sets up for X type of win based off of his visuals and the way that where he's betting at, like that's, that's such good information. And like, I, I've never personally had success hunting a specific bed. Uh, but then there's people that do. And like Greg Litzinger, I just brought him up a little bit ago, but he will hunt right over that bed in the mornings. And I, I've just never, I've never been able to do that, but it's not saying that, I mean, he's obviously had a ton of success for it. And I think it's just very situational. Yeah. You know, I, I tend to like pay attention to areas more than I do specific beds, but, uh, it's, <clears throat> it's, um, it's so cool when you learn that kind of and stuff. And you, you said it, like, it's not the information for that specific spot that's benefiting you. But like, if you have a stand on your back and you're scouting, you know, an acorn flat or a clear and like there's a knob that lines up with the wind just like what you have in your head from that setup and you see a little bit of buck sign you know close by well now you got the confidence that this probably sets up similar to that one time i had that camera there and got that picture so yep. it's like situational yep. but like it really does like help you know everything that you can build up makes a huge difference yeah, it's worth trying. That's that's why I look at it. You get you get enough information that it's like you gotta make a decision. It's almost impossible, especially in the big woods, to have all of that information like lined up. You know, you have say you have, you know, you know, you have five columns or five rows that you have of criteria to hit the green light on all of those rarely ever happens. You know, it's like you just gotta take the information you have and sometimes just throw it at it. And most of the time it doesn't work, but you keep doing that. Eventually it is. Gonna yeah. Work. Um, it was a, a weird situation cause I definitely didn't think about it as a bed, but, uh, that spot I had mentioned earlier where there was like that thin sh strip of spruce within the cedar swamp. So when I had gone in to hunt that the second year, the first year I hunted it, I shot like a two-year-old eight-pointer. I was like 15, thrilled, was with my buddy, shot a buck coming around the tip of that. The next year, I was going to hunt um, from a stand in that same area. Hadn't gone in there, right? Nobody can go in there. That was my rule. Stay the heck out of there. Went in there like November 19th, opening a gun season. And there's a little dusting of snow. And I walk up to that little thin strip of spruce where I'm going to like put my stand. And all of a sudden I see there's a huge rub inside like that little spruce strip, huge cedar tree. It's all ripped up. I'm like, Oh, that's sweet. You know, I'm putting my stand right here by that. So it's still dark in the morning, I climb up. I'm only like seven or eight feet up in the cedar swamp. So I can see below the branches. And as soon as I get up there, I look back into that little thicket of pines and right next to that rub is a huge bed melted out in the snow. And then that morning at like 11 o'clock, I shot a really nice buck that was coming back in that way. And I was like, I wonder if he was actually using that. I had no idea that deer were bedding in there, yeah. but there was a huge melted up. And I was like, oh my God, I bet you that was his flipping bed. Like he was coming back in. What are the odds? <laughs> so total accidental <laughs> bed hunt right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Hey, that's, 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 uh, that's, that's the perfect case scenario. It's like, I'd rather not know a hundred percent because he's dead, like that he went back to it. Right. <laughs> Uh, it's it's funny because like and like talking about like areas where you think a buck is betting and like hunting it like when i the opening day buck i shot in 2021 i was almost certain that this buck bedded on this like hemlock covered point that was behind me and after i shot him and because i didn't make the best shot and he went back to what I would assume is safe place you know to lay down where he ended up dying at but when we were tracking him I was like, holy cow, he was in this like bottom that was like of goldenrod, so high, you know, goldenrod grass and stuff in there. And it was just like little island of trees there, and that's where he was bedded. And uh, then he jumped up, and he only went another 40 yards, and that's where he died. But it was like, I bet he was bedding there the whole time, but I thought he was bedding over here. It didn't really matter because I'm still in the right spot for him. him to go either direction. And it's like, I, I'll be okay with that, you know, even though I wasn't exactly right, it, it still put me in the the – the right spot, I guess. You know how it really is, man. And I hear guys who talk with such confidence about what they know the deer was doing. Man, most of the time when I thought I knew what was going on, the deer comes from the other direction. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't know how people are so certain because for me, like, I can have the best laid plans and something's always going to be different. It's going to change. Like, it's just such a fluid game that we play. Like, it's always changing. Always. 
the the way the way I look at it is like I don't know anything when it comes to these deer. Like I I don't know for certain of anything. You just make these like you know these inferences in your head of like this is what I think they're doing, and you like build that confidence in yourself. Like that's what I think they're doing, but it doesn't. That's usually not exactly the case, and that's okay yeah. if it you know it works out. It's like you don't have to have all those pieces exactly. Yeah, right. you just do the best you can. Um, that's where all those like prior like. You know, even just having like running lots of trail cams, I think it's such a benefit that like a lot of newer people like, you know, like you don't have. But like when you can hang cameras in the big woods and get mature bucks on like most of them, you're obviously figuring out pieces of the puzzle. Right. Like so even that confidence you get from just camera pictures like, oh, in this spot, I got daylight pictures of a mature deer. Like you are on to something like there's lots of guys who don't run yeah. cameras who like that confidence just from like knowing where they tend to be like is never there. So like all those experiences really add up. And like, even if it's not specifically hunting, like the scouting, the sheds, the trail camera stuff, man, it all plays a part. And like those people who are successful, it's not always luck. Like they, it's a lot of time that has went into it and built that background knowledge. hundred <laughs> percent, man. I couldn't explain that any better. But anyways, Derek, I think, uh, I think we're going to wrap this one up awesome. here, but I mean, I really, I really enjoyed this conversation and, and getting to talk with you there. It's, it's funny because you and I never talked on the phone or anything before that, but I felt like that I've uh, known you at hunting camp forever talking about it and getting, getting into these stories. So I, I really enjoyed it and I'd like for you to be able to tell everybody where they can follow along with your stuff and then the okay is hunters plug anything that you would like oh to yeah to absolutely out. if you haven't checked out oks hunter uh my buddy tyler and eric uh do a great job running that it's for a great cause we do a podcast got a youtube show that's absolutely ridiculous it's just stupid hunting so if you want entertainment check that out everything is okay hunter so youtube instagram all that stuff uh, my personal instagram is the great art doors like outdoors but art because i'm an art teacher so I post some of my own stuff on there, but you can find me there or, you know, that's about it. Thanks for having me, Bo. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks, man. I really do appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.